Give an update on the racist incidents on campus and the Not Again SU movement. And we speak with a national correspondent here covering the issue. Plus, an update on additional threats, why the FBI is now on campus. All that plus your weather and orange sports coming up on this edition of Mornings on the Hill. Good morning, I'm Dana Casillo. Thanks for joining us for Mornings on the Hill. And I'm Sharif King. We start this morning with a look at events of the last week and a half surrounding several racist incidents in the Not Again Issue movement. There have been at least 10 incidents of racist graffiti and attacks in the last two weeks, and many of the protests on campus center around social media. Our Shoshana Stahl is live in studio to tell us how the Not Again SU movement is sharing their message. So before we dive into the latest news, we want to review how we got to where we are today. So Renegade Magazine posted on social media that on November 6th, someone wrote the N-word on the bathrooms of floors 4 and 6 in Day Hall. They said DPS told the residents not to spread this information. Then Not Again SU began protesting at the barns with sit-ins and sleep-ins. A major aspect of their movement has been through social media. Their mission statement reads that Not Again SU is a black student-led movement that believes in transparency from the administration. And then these are some of their Instagram story templates designed by the PR committee of Not Again SU. So they allow you to fill in your name and your organization to show your support of the movement. But then they also have one for people who don't go to Syracuse so that they can get more national attention. And then this is a timeline of the events that they posted. So after the original incident in Day Hall, there have been five instances of graffiti and vandalism both on and off campus. A large group of people verbally attacked an African-American woman using the N-word. They are reported to be members of the Alpha Chi Rho fraternity. So then Alpha Cairo has now been expelled indefinitely from campus and all fraternities on campus have had their social events suspended for the rest of the semester. This post says that it's not just a Greek life issue but a student body issue. And then this is the most recent update which involves a manifesto from a shooting that was airdropped to students at Bird. This was then brought to the FBI as well. And this is just a post that's going around social media to talk about this. And then students were telling Chancellor Severu that they didn't feel safe going to class. So the Student Association posted this on Instagram, releasing their statement which urged classes to get canceled. Classes were not canceled, but professors have been canceling classes and individual schools have made classes optional, which you can see in this that a lot of lectures have been empty. And then DPS said in their statement that there was no appearance of a direct threat, but many people on campus, like this person, said that they don't agree and that it is a direct threat. And then Governor Cuomo released a statement saying that he doesn't think the chancellor is handling this matter in a way that instills confidence. This is his statement that's also been posted by Not Again SU. Students have been tweeting and posting on Instagram that they don't feel safe on campus, and social media has just been a big platform allowing students across the school and nation to talk about what's happening here on campus. So for Mornings on the Hill, I'm Shoshana Stahl. Security is being increased on campus amid an investigation into a document said to be a white supremacist Supremacist Manifesto. It was sent to cell phones of students at Bird Library. Syracuse Police Chief Kent Buckner says DPS reached out to the Syracuse Police Department just before 11 p.m. last night. After that, the Criminal Investigation Division began looking into the manifesto. You went through a lot over the past, uh, what is now almost two weeks. Uh, no student should have to, to go through that. No citizen should have to go through that. And we understand uh, the level of concern that our students have. As of yesterday, New York State troopers are involved in the case. Troopers were seen arriving on campus yesterday around 9 a.m., including one station outside of the Barnes Center. Citrus TV estimates there were at least over a dozen squad cars on campus. The university is still working to manage student safety concerns. Meanwhile, recent events are now gaining national attention. Several major newspapers and TV networks are now on campus following the latest reports and protests. One of the reporters on campus is CBS correspondent Adriana Diaz, who says that the incidents like these are becoming all too common among college campuses. Well, this is a really big story nationally. The Anti-Defamation League has talked about how white supremacist propaganda is on the rise on campuses across the country, but we also covered the fraternity issue here at Syracuse last year. So we've been paying attention to what's happening at the university. As the sit-in has continued, we have continued to watch it and to see how involved students are getting, how uh, concerned many students are. 
as well as the chancellor's responses. So uh, people higher up than me uh, wanted to make sure that we were here to continue covering the story. Diaz also says it's important for networks to make sure they have all the right information when they arrive in the middle of the story to make sure all sides are shared. Well, all stories that we cover, we want to go into the situation and be aware of the circumstances, be aware of the context. Um, and uh, especially a story like this one, especially a story where students don't feel safe, where uh, people have been victimized, um, where not all the facts of what happened and who did what are out there. You want to just be really uh, sensitive. Uh and Dia says one thing that's been helping them do their job correctly is reporting from student journalists on campus. One thing that's really struck us is the involvement of student journalists here at Syracuse in telling this story. Um, a lot of student journalists have been uh, you know, volunteering with us, uh, asking if we need any help. We've read the Daily Orange uh, to get the students' take on, on the events here on campus. And even with the sit-in, uh, we spoke to students at the sit-in who weren't comfortable having outside cameras in their space, but they were comfortable having student journalists there. So we've used Citrus TV footage on our air at the network. So uh, the involvement and the tenacity of student journalists here at Syracuse has really contributed to telling the story nationally. And continuing that student coverage is our Morgan Trow. She is live to tell us about a form happening later today that will address the freshman year on campus. Thanks guys. I'm live outside the Barnes Center where the seventh day of protests are taking place. But at 4 p.m., people will be moving to Maxwell Auditorium to attend the SU Senate um, event, where people will be talking about what kind of changes are going to be happening within the first year experience. But that's not all they're going to be talking about. Made the collective decision to admit the students. We have the moral responsibility to support them. Syracuse University Director of Asian and Asian American Studies, Dr. Yingyi Ma, is referring to international students. She says the past two weeks have been difficult as protests continue for the Not Again SU movement, with a large portion of participants being Asian students. For international students, uh, language barriers do exist. A university Senate member who is representing Chinese students in the meeting has a statement prepared addressing her experience at SU and racism. For her safety, she wishes to remain anonymous. Part of her interview and statement says this. As an international student, we do not have enough ability to protest, even to protect ourselves, because we could lose our student visas at any time. We feel our issues are being pushed aside when all we are asking for is to feel safe and to understand our professors. She also has a list of demands for the administration to provide. The short term include anyone involved in racial discrimination to be punished, more secure facilities, and 24-hour patrolling by police. The long term include more in-depth bias training, added minority scholarships, and reviews to university and DPS hate speech policy. Yingyi is proud of the protesters, and so is the university senator, because she says it is a courageous act to do so far from home. Sometimes hard changes or solid changes, um, you know, only happen in that way, you know, through demands. And after the Senate meeting from 6 to 7.30 p.m., the Chancellor's Forum at Goldstein Auditorium will be addressing the protesters' concerns and have his response. I will have everything updated for you. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Morgan Trout. As we gear up for the holiday season, everyone is getting ready for that busy travel season. Our own Jillian Andrews tells us about the transportation opportunities through campus. If you're flying home or taking the train for Thanksgiving break, hold off on calling that Uber because campus offers free shuttles to the airport at the end of this week. Shuttles run on both Thursday and Friday of this week. The pickup from the Shine Center on the hour every hour. They drop off at the RTC every 20 minutes after the hour and drop off at the airport 30 to 40 minutes past the hour. And then on Sunday, when everyone's returning on December 1st, between 10 a.m. and 10 p.m., the buses will bring students back from those locations. If you're interested in taking a charter bus for $99 round trip, you can go to New York City, Boston, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, or Rockway through the university. However, tickets have been on sale since August, so move quickly if you're interested. 
And as always, be very careful when you leave your apartments and houses for break. Every entranceway should be locked, including windows. Make sure you remove all valuables from your home. That includes items in your cars if they're staying in Syracuse over break. Items you can't take with you, like TVs, make sure they're not visible from the outside. And don't leave spare keys outside under the mat because that's just not a good idea. Back to you guys at the desk. It's another quiet, cloudy day here in Syracuse. Weather anchor Alex Peebles is live out on University Ave to tell us what we can expect. Thanks, Sharif. I'm outside on University Ave. It's another quiet and calm gray day here in Syracuse. We are going to expect a, a bit of a higher chance of some scattered snow showers slash rain. Uh, again, not a high chance, but higher than yesterday and the day before that. As you're going to class, layer up. It feels like it's about 33 degrees. That temperature will rise up into the low 40s by the end of the day today. But again, the best way to combat this colder weather is layers. Um, it's a bit windy out, so those windbreakers, heavier jackets, gloves. Um, I'm missing one crucial element, uh, a hat or earmuffs to keep the ears warm. Uh, definitely plays a big role. I've been out here for a while. It does get a little bit chilly if you have a long walk to class. Um, we're actually going to expect tomorrow um, some winds coming up from the south, southeast. That's going to bring some warmer weather, uh, but we'll have more on that later on this newscast. Again, layer up as you're going to class. You should stay dry, but just be prepared. Back to you guys at the desk. Coming up here on Mornings on the Hill. After a successful weekend on the Hill, Alexandra Jenner-John has your full Orange Sports update. Plus, Tom Bielkind sits down with a foster family on campus. Stay with us for those stories and much more. Ew. Syracuse sophomore Jack Cruiser is used to having a microphone in his hand, but this year the position behind the mic changed a bit. Our Michelle Knezovic sat down with him to find out how. I started singing back in middle school, I want to say. I did a talent show in like third grade, and that was fun. Um, Jack Cruiser continued his love for singing through musicals throughout high school. So when a friend suggested he continue to sing in college, it was a no-brainer. So we thought about doing a cappella um, until he was my friend who was in an a cappella group at UB was like, hey, they invite us to their shows every year and you should definitely try out for them. All throughout middle school, Cruiser would call high school sporting events. But once he started college, he didn't think he would continue broadcasting. Um, while not being, you know, a BDJ major or even being in Newhouse, but when I saw the audition, I was like, yeah, this is a way that I can possibly keep that side of my life intact and, and bring it with me to school. Hey, Syracuse fans, we're up here Jack now sings a cappella, is the women's in-game basketball coast, and is in a band. USA. He said there is so just something the about being in a sports Bill atmosphere, though, Bill that he just loves. Bringing that atmosphere to a women's basketball game, I think, has always been a passion of mine. And I don't know why, but it just... Here, we would like to acknowledge today's he may not know why he loves it so much, but he does know he wouldn't change it. Unbelievable experience that I, I wouldn't trade for the world. We'll be performing this Thursday at Funkin' Waffles downtown at 8 p.m. And we'll also be hosting the women's basketball game against Oregon on Sunday at 4 p.m. It was a successful weekend for Syracuse Athletics. Our sports anchor, Jenna John, is in studio with your sports update. Good morning, I'm Alexandra Jenner John with your Orange Sports Update here on Mornings on the Hill. The football team got their first ACC win of the season with a 49-6 victory over Duke on Saturday. Coming off four straight losses, Syracuse finally showed a glimpse the of their potential. On top of putting up six points of their own, the Oranges reworked defense held Duke to just six points and less than 300 total yards of offense. Offensively, it was the Orange running game that helped light up the scoreboard with four separate players finding the end zone on the ground. This was a nice sight for SU fans to see after the ground game has struggled for most of the season. The Orange will play their next game on Saturday at 4 p.m. against Louisville. The women's basketball team had their third consecutive win with a 75-53 win over Albany on Saturday in the Dome. The Orange led most of the way but put the game to rest in a dominant fourth quarter, putting up 21 points to the Danes 11. 
Three players contributed double-figure scores to secure a win by 22 over Albany. Kiara Lewis had 17, Emily Engseler had 14, and Gabrielle Cooper had 10. Syracuse will host top-ranked Oregon this Sunday in one of the most anticipated matchups of the season. Tip-off is set for 4 o'clock in the Dome. And the men's basketball team had another win in the Dome on Saturday, beating Seattle 89-67. to Freshman guard Joe Girard III was leading scorer for Cuse with 24 points and 5 rebounds. Elijah Hughes contributed 15 points, 6 rebounds and 3 assists, and Marek Dolajai added 19 points and 4 assists. Coach Jim Beheim will coach the Orange and his son Buddy against Cornell and his other son Jimmy, marking the second year in a row for the Battle of the Beheims. Tip-off is at 7.30 tonight in the Dome. And Syracuse men's soccer is continuing their season. Over the weekend, they made the NCAA tournament with an at-large bid. They host Rhode Island at the SU Soccer Stadium on Thursday at 7 p.m. Head coach Ian McIntyre is giving away free tickets to the first 200 students that arrive. That's it for your Wednesday Orange Sports Update. Back to you guys. It is the season of giving and the Syracuse Sports Management Club is making a difference in the community. The club partnered with Make-A-Wish for their annual sports charity auction. The money raised at the event will help grant wishes to children in the central New York area. Our Cheyenne Nebrega has the story. The Make-A-Wish Foundation is a nonprofit organization that brings hope and joy to children's lives. One child's wish of having a batting cage was granted at the men's basketball game versus Seattle University during halftime. It is the ultimate to be able to say to a child that your wish is going to come true and what an incredible opportunity for him to be here. The young boy and his mother were greeted by thousands of fans in the Carrier Dome for the wish presentation. This went hand in hand with the sport charity auction that was also going on during the basketball game. It is the 15th year of the auction and the Syracuse Sports Management Club has raised over $450,000 for local charities. This year, the club picked Make-A-Wish. I've seen wishes get granted up on stage. It's, there's no other feeling like it, seeing a child just get hope again in their families and how resilient they are, so it, there's no feeling like it. Past charities the auction has benefited is the Boys and Girls Club of Central New York and the Food Bank. Students spend the entire semester gathering items for the auction. Items include sports memorabilia, gift cards, and luxury trips. Students also plan and work the event. We teaches our students to use sport as a platform to teach social responsibility. More importantly, we impress upon the students that Syracuse is your home for four years and it's important to give back to the community. and one student going above and beyond to help animals feel right at home. Our own Tom Bielkind is live in studio this morning with the SU senior making a difference to some furry friends. Thanks, Dana. I'm joined this morning by Allegra Craver, senior here at SU. Um, so Allegra, just can you tell us what is this program that you've been working with? So I work with the Cat Coalition of Central New York. Um, they're a nonprofit here in uh, northern New York, and they basically take cats off the street and try to find homes for them via foster parents like myself. And so how did you get involved with them? Oh, um, I knew I wanted to foster cats for a while, so when me and my roommate finally had our own place on campus, we were like, you want to foster cats? Sure. <laughs> and we just contacted them and told them what we were about. We're students, we'd like cats, we both have cats at home, and um, we'd like to try to foster cats. So they hooked us up with a foster mom, and she now gives us cats to foster for a couple weeks. <laughs> so can you walk us through the process? Like, so the foster mom gives you the cats, and, yeah. then, and then what goes on from there? So she gives us the cat, and then essentially what happens is we feed them, we, you know, give them a little home, and then once there's a spot for them in an adoption center like PetSmart or just a shelter, um, the foster mom takes them back and puts them in the shelter. And right here on the screen, <laughs> who, are we, who are we looking at there? That is Ozzy. She is our most recent foster cat. Um, we called her Ruth after Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and then we called her Nala because she looks like Nala from The Lion King. <laughs> how, long have you had, uh, how long have you had Ruth? Um, we've had her for, she's one of our longer ones, so we've had her for about like four weeks, like a month-ish, I would say. Uh, and how long will you usually have cats for, and especially with Ruth, how long is she going to be around for? 
So uh, we usually have them for like two to three weeks, a couple, the first cat we had, and then Ruth, um, we had them for about a month, maybe a little more, and now since I'm adopting Ruth, <laughs> I've gone through five cats. She's the fifth one, and I got attached finally, so she's um, gonna stay with me for the next 16 years of my life. <laughs> and can you just expand, how can students here who are interested in this get involved? So if you want to foster cats, you just contact the Cat Coalition of Central New York, just tell them that you're a student and you have a home that would like a cat and they will hook you up from there. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us, Allegra, this morning. Uh, yeah, no Sharif problem. and Dana, back to you guys. Great time. Still come here on Mornings on the Hill. Alex is back with your full weather forecast. Stick with us. So our latest edition of Eat and Tell, Michelle Knezevic visit a parfait bar on campus. On this week's edition of Eat and Tell, Yodi's going to show us what foods you need to eat to start off your morning. Come on, guys, let's go. These are some options that you can just grab a little bit quicker if there's a line and they, you pretty much always have the eggs. So tell me a little bit more about these things you always have here for breakfast. Okay, so there's always scrambled eggs and then whether it's hash browns, look at these beautiful hash browns they have today. Um, hash browns or some kind of potato and then there's either bacon or sausage. And when there's bacon, there's turkey bacon. When there's sausage, there's turkey sausage. We also have vegan options. Um, so there's food for everyone. This is our omelet bar. You can choose what you want in the omelet and then they make it to order. All right, so um, I would love... Let's make it very colorful. Get all those yeah. veggies in there. And then you bring it over to our um, omelet makers. Okay. Um, an omelet with, what do you got? Cheddar. Look at the sizzle. <laughs> this is great for students because it'll allow them, even if they have a bunch of classes in a row, then they can be full up until like a late lunch, early dinner. I know, this is a great um, meal. It really fills you up and you can cater it to what you want. Waffles and all the toppings, they have syrup, they have cherries, they have apples, and then even whipped cream. <laughs> Treat that yourself. <laughs> a cherry on top, a little breakfast dessert. As always, you can get information about SU Food Services at foodservices.syr.edu. And now let's get that full forecast. Alex, what do you have for us? So today's daily planner. Uh, again, it's going to be a little bit warmer today. We're going to get almost up into those 40s midday. It's going to drop back down uh, later on, but we're dry for the most part. Only a 20% chance. That's the highest chance of precipitation we had, and that's the, the late morning. Uh, places down in Cortland saw some flurries here and there, but again, it's going to be a little bit too warm for, for any rain. It's going to be dry anyways. So um, it feels like 33 degrees at the moment. Or when we're, we look back at the almanac, uh, today's actually quite low for the record high being about 74 degrees in 1921. That's a, 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 you know, a long time ago, obviously. Uh, but again, our high is still pretty good for this time of year. 43 degrees is the high today. Not sure if we'll actually see it get that high. Might feel a little bit colder than that. Uh, but tomorrow we're going to expect a cold, uh, um, excuse me, a warm front coming in. It's going to warm up even more tomorrow. Uh, that's due to the winds coming from the northeast right now. They're actually going to be coming from the south southeast. And then tomorrow night, as we get into it, it's going to drop back down to about 35 degrees. Um, and that's when the cold front's going to come in. And that might bring some precipitation as well. Um, now, when we're talking about uh, travel and Getting out of Dodge here for the holiday season, we might see some rain on Friday and uh, you know, it could affect your travel plans. Alex, how is it looking for us to go back home for Thanksgiving break? Yeah, so we're gonna see some precipitation. Uh, it's not gonna be anything crazy like snow. It's gonna be a little bit too warm for that. You might see a bit of a mix, um, but again, you know, driving in the rain is better than driving in the snow. You still wanna be cautious with, you know, your speeds and, and whatever mode of transportation you're going home with. Looking forward to it. I'm yeah. just glad there's not a lot of snow right now. 
It'll come. It'll come. We're still a little bit early on that. Um, Thanksgiving week should be all right. One pro programming note before we say goodbye. You might have noticed there was no programming on the Orin Television Network before we got on the air. And that will be true again once we are done. The staff at OTN decided that in light of recent events on campus, regular programming was not appropriate. But General Manager Andrew Robinson tells us he felt it was important that the news coverage continue to keep the campus informed. So that's why we've been on the air, and Citrus TV News at 6 will also be on the air later today. That is going to be it for us this Wednesday here on Mornings on the Hill. I'm Sharif King. Be sure to follow us on social media at I am Sharif D. King at Mornings on the Hill. I'm Dana Casillo. Thanks for watching Orange Nation. We'll be off next week for Thanksgiving, but we'll see you in two weeks, live at 10 a.m. right here on Mornings on the Hill.